to another episode of Turn Left. I am your host, Indiana Zone, Dana Black, coming to you live. Yes, all the way live from Black Pearl Studios, where we talk about Indiana politics from the left side of things. How y'all doing? How your mama doing? Everybody good? Hey, listen, I got a little rant today. It's not going to be long because I got some great guests and some fresh blood. Ooh, I love fresh blood. Ah, I can smell it in the air. Fresh. Anyway, uh, first of all, na 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 na. Hey hey hey. Goodbye, Curtis Hill. Kurt, can can one of y'all turn your mic, your speaker down just a little bit? I got an echo. There you go. Uh, Curtis Hill is going bye bye. I, you know what? I always had, it, I always figured uh, anyone who 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 came from the region or up in the Elkhart area who was an Elvis personator, something was not quite right with that fella, but he's gone. Now, we know Mr. Touch Me Not is, is leaving, but please understand who's taking his place or who's gonna be running in his stead. Mr. Todd, I will sacrifice a life for the economy, Rakita is running for attorney general. So if you think getting rid of Curtis Hill was all right, no, 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 no. Todd Rikita will come in and he will do everything he can to continue the work of a Curtis Hill only at a breakneck speed. See, cause see Curtis thought he was really one of the, one of the good old boys and he was going to be able to get away with misbehaving like the rest of the good old boys. Didn't work out for that brother, did it? But Todd Rikita won't have the same restraints. He's not going to have the same restraints. So he's going to go full bore on affordable health care. He doesn't want you to have it. He doesn't feel like you need it. He's going to risk your life for the economy. So please understand, we want Jonathan Winesapple. Jonathan Winesapple is our choice. We want to make sure that we send him to the AG office and not Ty Rikita. Lord Jesus, they keep recycling that boy. I mean, he ought to be about what on his third, fourth life by now. Good Lord, we can't get rid of him. All right. Terrible news to report, and I'm sure you guys have all been paying attention to the governor and his Rona updates. In Indiana, the virus is on the rise. It's on the rise, and unfortunately, um, can I get one of you to turn your, mic your microphone down just a little bit more? I still got an echo coming. Thank you. Okay, perfect, perfect. As long as you can hear me, that's, uh, that's perfect. So Rona's on the rise, and we know why the numbers are on the rise. When they said that they were going to open the state back up, we said on this show, oh my God, we hope that we are wrong. We hope that when we open this state back up, we will not see an uptick in coronaviruses. Oh my gosh, please, I want to be wrong. Well, Indiana Zone was not wrong. You were not wrong. Our listeners were not wrong. We knew because people want to argue over science. Me and Julie were just talking about how we arguing with people who don't even have high school diplomas about science. How does that work out for us? It's not. We knew what the risks were. We try to tell him he's not listening because you know what? What's a few who's your lives for the economy? What's a few who's your lives for the economy when, it, when you ask Republicans? They came out with the status of their budget this, today. And oh, we're still in great financial shape, but we are losing lives. I don't understand why you praising anything other than saying we need to get this virus under control. Before you listen to, I've never worked in a classroom or in a school, Betsy DeVos. What does she know about educating kids? Nothing. But she is continuing to send these guidelines down to Hoosiers to say what we should be doing about our students. When we don't have a plan in place, we don't have we don't have anything that we need. And oh, by the way, I still understand what you're saying about kids or whatever. Of course, your science is all wrong. Kids do catch it. And we already know if you've been alive more than 15 minutes, you know, kids are germ hoarders. And schools ain't nothing but a festation of germs. So now all of a sudden COVID ain't going to spread in the school. But what happens to the adults, the teachers? the counselors, the cafeteria workers, the bus drivers. What happens to them? They not kids, they adults. 
Rona's going up and you still have not given me a, a quality plan on how we can open these schools back up. Nor have you talked about how you're going to make sure every student and teacher in 92 counties, if we can't open schools back up or if they don't feel safe about opening schools back up, how are you going to make sure they have internet access? You haven't even talked about that yet. You have not talked about the fact that we are not treating the internet like a utility like we should. The second thing I want to say is this. It is July 16th. You know the numbers are on the rise. You have plenty of time to figure out how every Hoosier who is registered to vote can vote by mail. Now, from what I understand, the last bit of information I got, Republicans are not even interested in discussing an alternative to in-person voting. They're not even interested in discussing it. I don't understand why they are okay and comfortable with Hoosiers having to make the choice between uh, doing their civic duty and voting in election or their health or the health of their loved ones. Because we already know the Rona will stay on your clothes for 12 days, on inanimate objects for 12 days. We know this because when they went on the boat and they was like, shoot, it's still alive. So you standing outside, social distancing, say you got grandma at home who was able to vote by mail, but you have to go out and you bring it back home. I'm sorry. I suggest this is my call to action to everybody when it comes to vote by mail. You put in a request, everybody that's listening, you put in a request for an absentee ballot and you make Secretary of State Connie Lawson's office tell you that protecting yourself from the coronavirus is not a reason, a valid reason to, to vote by mail. You make her office tell you because see, you don't, the, the rates are going up. You don't know. You might actually be on quarantine come November. You don't know because we opening everything up. People don't want to wear masks. They run around with AR-15s. You carrying an AR-15, but you can't wear a mask. We could get this thing from anybody and anywhere. So you might actually be on quarantine on election day. And I would like for her to tell all of you all why that protecting your health in the middle of a pandemic is not a good excuse on why you can absentee ballot. Put the request in y'all. Don't let them tell you what you can't do. This is your government. That's your state house. She works for you. Put it on her to tell us that we can't vote when we're trying to protect ourselves in the middle of a pandemic when we recognize the numbers are going up. You feel me? Don't allow this to happen, y'all. Don't allow it to happen. Shout out to Shelly Fitzgerald and Dominic of Shelly's Voice um, for their trans rally against the archdiocese. I, uh, I saw that this week, they last week, they were getting billions of dollars in tax money, but they are allowed to dim discri discriminate against the trans community. That is not acceptable. So we had a rally. But at the same time, Lords of London said, um, excuse me, uh, we're not going to insure you um, because you didn't tell us about the little child thing that you had going on. You had some cases pending. So we're just going to avoid your insurance plan. Can we do that? I don't understand. You hide pedophiles and predators, but you can't let trans students in your school and you're using my tax dollars for it. Huh? I'm a gender non-conforming lesbian and you taking my money. Did you take out the gender non-conforming lesbian money? Nope, you didn't. You took it off. So shout out to Shelly Fitzgerald and Shelly's voice. Matt Davis, my dude, my dude. He had black candidates all up uh, on the state house rallying to show, show, hey, we need to elect more black, uh, gay, and more diverse candidates. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that rally. Shout out to Eddie Melton for keeping your cool when the, the, the law enforcement was ready to pull a gun out on you. Shout out to JD Ford for standing up and being the ally you were supposed to be. We really appreciate that. But yo, Mr. Police Officer, you need to at least know who your damn state senators are before you try to pull a gun out on them. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We got real stuff going on. People running around here nervous. Running around here nervous. Ready to, to trigger happy and ready to, to, to blow up the whole world. For what? But see, that's why we have turned left. Because we... We talk about politics from the left side of things, and it's all about love. Y'all, I, I tell y'all all the time, I get excited when I get to meet new people. New people. I've never met these two folks a day in my life until today. 
And now we're already best friends. We're already best friends. Y'all give it up for my first guest, Mr. Aaron Mishler, who is a candidate in Indiana House District 48. Aaron, welcome to the show. Hey, great to meet you, and uh, thanks for uh, having me on. Absolutely. And my second guest, y'all give it up for Julie Dominguez. She's a candidate for the Indiana State Senate, District 16. Welcome, Julie. Hi, thank you. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm glad you're here. Hey, if you guys, as you guys are listening, and if you like anything that they are talking about, look in my, the title. There's a donate button for both Julie and Aaron. So if they say something that just blows your mind, and you like... I want to help them. You ain't got to look for it. It's right there. Just click the button and donate to these campaigns. So, Julie, I'm going to start with you. Tell the people who you are and where you come from. Sure. Well, like Dana said, I'm Julie Dominguez, and I'm running for state senate in District 16. I'm in the northeast corner of Indiana in Fort Wayne, and my district comprises of both Allen County and Whitley County. I'm Hoosier born and raised. I graduated from Ball State University. Then I got a master's degree from Northern Arizona University. I've been teaching in the public schools for over 20 years. And I'm a wife and a mom and a concerned community member. That's what's up. That's, that's, that's a lot of good stuff. So was there something in your youth that, that you experienced that made you say, hey, I'm going to be in politics? Or was it something that you discovered later in life? I think I had it in me from the time that I was a kid. I just didn't know it. I was always service oriented, always loved volunteering for different with different organizations and, and helping people. And then as I got older, I just got tired. I got tired of not being listened to as a constituent. I got tired of being not being listened to as a teacher for sure. And I just said, enough is enough. I'm done. I'm putting my hat in the ring and let's go and get this thing done. Absolutely. We need more and more teachers you know, running for office because obviously there's not enough teachers in that state house because they don't understand how valuable we are until there's a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> We've been begging them for, for, for years to give y'all a raise. Yeah, not only do we need more teachers, we also need more women in the state house too. I'm going to bring women's issues there, whether they like it or not. Here I come. I, I love it. I love that energy. You know, when you're talking about adding women to the table, whew, that gives me goosebumps. But Aaron, we're not going to leave you out. Tell the people who you are and where you come from. Thank you. Uh, my name is Aaron Mishler. I'm um, running for Indiana State House 48. I live here in Elkhart. And bringing up Elkhart, let me again apologize for Curtis Hill. <laughs> we're sorry about that. Sorry. Um, I grew up in Goshen. Um, graduated from Goshen High School. I served in the uh, Indiana Army National Guard uh, and then the Army Reserves. Um, I got my licensed practical nurse from the army. And then I earned an associate's degree from Ivy Tech in general studies. And then my registered nurse from um, Ancilla College. Oh. And um, yeah, I'm running because I, uh, I have a five-year-old daughter and I'm trying to make sure she has all the things in life that I you know, didn't have. I'm trying to make sure that everyone's kids do. Absolutely. I think it's interesting that I have a teacher and a nurse uh, on the show today, because the two hottest topics that I hear about running around the state when I could run around the state was education and health care. And here we have two people who are in those industries ready to serve. Um, so let's talk about the environment first. <laughs> I know it. I, I got you. I got you. We'll come back to y'all's hot topics in a minute. But the other thing that I notice about uh, when I'm running around the state is that when we talk to young people and I know that. You know, a lot of folks are not listening to young people because, you know, as we old folks do, what y'all know about, y'all need to keep living. But one of the things they keep saying is, can we have a planet to live on? I would like to be old and cantankerous, too. Talk about your concerns about Indiana and the environment and how we um, still have issues that we need to address, especially uh, up in that Elkhart area as well. Either one of y'all can go first. I don't care. Go ahead and go first. OK, sure. Well, um, Believe it or not, Indiana has a goal of using alternative fuels by 2025, and that goal is 10%. You've got to be kidding me. 10%. We are second in the nation for coal use. And we know what bill was just passed this legislative session mm -hmm. about it's harder to get out of using coal. We definitely have to do something about this. We need alternative en energy. We need renewable energy. 
in this state, we can do better than a bull of 10%. I think that's insulting. It is. <laughs> that's insulting. It's very insulting. I'm like, dang, 10%? But young people around here ain't gonna make it. Go ahead, uh, Aaron. Oh, um, yeah, you know, I just definitely have to agree. Um, not only in renewable energy, but we have to pr protect our farmlands, we have to protect our forests, our rivers, our wetlands here in the state, um, as well as our public beaches and things like that. For whatever reason, my opponent in the last legislative session introduced a bill to privatize public beaches in Michigan City. And why are we getting rid of public beaches? And why is somebody from Elkhart trying to do that? I don't know. But, you know, we definitely need to move towards renewable and we have to make sure that renewable energy is protected here, especially things like solar. In a lot of states, um, energy companies are moving to uh, get rid of the incentives for private homes and businesses to put on solar panels. And that's one thing that I won't let happen. I will protect uh, folks' ability and rights to resell energy back to the power uh, companies and, you know, make them profitable to have. Absolutely. I mean, well, first of all, the fact that some dude is trying to privatize public beaches, I know the other side of the aisle always is harping on entitlements. What is more, what, what else says entitlement more than we want, we don't want just anybody on this beach, on, on this public beach. We just want this to be all private just for us. That's, that's the essence and the epitome of entitlement. That's just ridiculous. Well, hopefully that won't ever go anywhere. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so let's talk about our veterans for a minute. One of the things I want to make sure I do better about is um, talking about our veteran care. We know that Indiana is, uh, uh, as of, in many categories, we're, we're at the bottom um, for our veterans who are ready to retire and live somewhere. They tell them, don't go to Indiana. Talk about what we need to do better um, by our veterans. We swear we love the flag and salute that flag, but when they come home, it's like, yeah, dog, sorry. Either one. Yeah, of go ahead. I know you're you're a veteran. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's uh, my father um, was a Vietnam veteran, and so growing up, um, that's one of the reasons that I've kind of moved originally into activism and and now into politics. He, you know, fought. In the early 90s, uh, his big passion was the POW MIA issue. And I remember when I was a little kid, he built a, a bamboo cage on his garage in Gas City, Indiana. And he stayed in that uh, bamboo cage for three months in the dead of winter, protesting the normalizations of relations with Vietnam while there were still unsolved questions about the POW MIA issue. Wow. So veterans issues have been close to my heart since I was a kid. And there's so many things that we could do at a state level that not only benefits um, everyone, but benefits the veterans community as well. You know, we could work better um, integrating veterans when they come back into the state, helping um, them transfer their skills that they used in the military into finding good paying jobs here. Um, we could also help with things, um, you know, regarding legalization of marijuana for a lot of veterans dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, you know, recreationally and medicinally, um, it would be very beneficial to the, the veterans here in the state if if they could have that um, ability. And the fact that Indiana continues to be an island of prohibition uh, makes it definitely less appealing to veterans to come to this state. As, well, and you know what is really bad about it? You know, they, they swear they want to be like the holders of all the surplus money. Look at all that money you letting go. Look at all like that tax money you just letting go to Michigan, go to Illinois, go to Kentucky, go to Ohio. Literally, in in in, in forty five minutes, if if I was a user, I could go somewhere else and get what I needed and take that Indiana money somewhere else. But they just so high on they you can't. If I don't want you to do it, you shouldn't do it. Nonsense, yep. you know. But these are the same people that don't believe you should wear a mask. Don't understand. You know, how does, how's that? How's that work? How's that work? Julian, uh, do, you, do you have any do you have any uh, uh, knowledge or concerns about what's going on in the veteran community? I do. My dad is also a Vietnam vet. He served in Vietnam. Um, he was a dog handler and had to walk the point with a German shepherd. Uh, That's what he did while he was overseas. And I saw firsthand what it was like to grow up with somebody with PTSD mm -hmm. and um you know, needing that care, those mental health services and, 
and, you know, uh, his ear drum was blown out, um, you know, and was hard of hearing and, and just trying to get that help. And my parents are retired and they were in Indiana, but they left. And <laughs> he's, he's getting great care where they are now wow. from the, from the you, VA. So I'm, I'm really happy. They're in Martinsburg, West Virginia. And they live about, yeah, it's in the panhandle of uh, West Virginia, uh, just on the border of Northern Virginia. My sister lives in Northern Virginia, Leesburg. So they moved out there and he's about five minutes away from the VA. And he's, he said he's getting great care out there in West Virginia. Well, see, that doesn't make any sense. Cause see, economically, we're supposed to be in a much better position. Indiana is than West Virginia. How is it that we are able to treat our, they are able to treat their veterans a better and get better care in West Virginia than we do in this surplus ridden state of Indiana? Exactly. Well, our, our health care in general is abysmal. Um, one of the things that I'm promoting in my campaign is health care for all, because a lot of Hoosiers don't have access to it. And with this pandemic, come on, everybody needs it. And we should, um, you know, have a state public option like some other states do, you know, that lowers premiums and allows you to access your health care before your deductible is even spent. You know, we can do this. We can do anything that we set our minds to, and our people deserve to have this option. Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, a uh, state-by-state um, public option, because there are some people who believe that this can only be done at the federal level. And here you are saying, nope, 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 states' rights, states' rights. We can, we can do right. this here. We can do it. We can. I know you want to chime in on that, Aaron. I know you're just itching back there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's time we start using those uh, Tenth Amendment rights and start um, working towards health care for uh, all of our citizens here in uh, Indiana. Indiana, when it comes to health care, we, we have a lot, uh, a lot to do. Uh, for instance, our infant mortality in the state of Indiana is pretty abysmal. Um, it's one of the worst in the country. And to just how bad it is, we're, we're only really beat out by Latvia when it comes to um, places with uh, worse infant mortality rates than we are. And it doesn't even have to be very complex um, things that we could do to, to help folks. We could do simple things like providing ride vouchers for pregnant women so they can make their OB appointments. Um, a big you know, problem is just not being able to have transportation to go to the appointments. And if we could solve just a little thing like that, we can help a lot of kids and we could help a lot of moms. And that's not even addressing the larger structural issues, you know, we could, we can definitely do some good. Absolutely. Especially, then, we, we, especially when we have counties um, in our state, they don't even have medical facilities. Um, I had a, a, a guest on a couple weeks ago um, from the Martinsville area and she was saying, we don't have a hospital, but we got a cancer center. And I'm like, what? <laughs> we, you have enough uh, 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 capacity for a full blown specialty clinic cancer because we already know that martinsville is a cancer pocket but you can't have the the health care facilities that maybe could help prevent it from becoming what it is it does it just doesn't make any sense and where our priorities are and that's that's absolutely right and there's you know many other things we could do at the state level one of the things that i propose is capping insulin copayment costs i had a, a very good friend of mine that i grew up with was my best friend in elementary school and in the middle school and um he unfortunately had to ration his insulin um, and he passed away um, probably mm. and directly re uh, related to that a few years ago. And it, it, it hurts to see. And I know we as a state and as a country can do better than that. And healthcare also ties into so many other issues in the state uh, for criminal justice reform. Um, I worked as a corrections nurse for four years in the mm. St. Joe County jail and just not only the opioid epidemic, but ever since mental health institutions and access began to disappear in the late 80s and 90s, county jails have turned into ad hoc mental institutions. I can't tell you what percentage of medications that I gave to inmates that were strictly uh, psych meds. Mm. Um, and, you know, it's, it really hurts to see because these folks would come in, we would get them stabilized on medication, and then we would release them. And without a, a support system in the com community, they would, you know, have difficulty yeah. again, and we would see them in a few weeks or months. And we can do better than that. We can fix these problems. Absolutely. And, and the crazy thing is that um, we know that is the case. I mean, even when I worked at the city county building here in Indianapolis, um, in the IT department, 
<laughs> I knew while working with IMPD, they knew who their frequent flyers were. And that's what they call them, frequent flyers. They knew why they were frequent flyers. We So it, everybody knows the problem, but nobody really wants to fix the problem. They want to just keep addressing the symptoms and putting Band-Aids on the symptoms. Oh, by the way, especially when you consider, you know, organizations like Pentech, you know, uh, who are making money off of, you know, making money off of uh, uh, slave labor uh, in our justice system or just the private inst the private prisons altogether. So there's, mm -hmm. you know, it's always, it's always about money. We can really improve the lives of people. Just think, I'm going on a rant. I'm sorry. This show is supposed to be for y'all. But <laughs> just think how, if we would allow people to get the help, the mental help they need, be they veterans, um, be they whatever, the opioid addiction, that's, if, and if they could get themselves together and get a job, that's tax revenue. That's That means that's things that can help us. And then I won't be so mad about your dag burn, you know, surplus, with, you know, a hole in the roof. Y'all chime in. Don't Don't let me do this. Well, a lot of these problems um, are, are interrelated, you know, and we have people on the right and, you know, all they want to do is talk about the economy. Well, then let's put some rural broadband out there. We can do that. The state of Kentucky did it. Why can't we lay fiber optic cables all over the state of Indiana and get a public private partnership going, you know, with 100 gigabit speeds or better with, you know, multi-tier packages, et cetera. Then we can bring telehealth to the rural area. We can provide internet for our school children who probably are gonna have to go home anyway because of the pandemic eventually because COVID numbers are going up and we can you know, help people create jobs. Why is it that we're not doing these things when they're gonna help healthcare and the economy and education all together? So I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering if it's, you know, I don't want every Hoosier to have an opportunity. I, I just want to keep it all to myself. I mean, it, it, I, I know, see, I think that's the, the biggest difference between us on this side and them on that side. They are like, it seems like their mentality is, I did this all on my own. I worked hard for it. I did it all by myself. And I don't want to have to share it with nobody. And we're on the other side going, listen, we working hard too. We, 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 we doing the best we can, but I want to make sure my fellow man over here has an opportunity to, you know, to, to be successful too. Oh, some of this came to my mind. Which one of those sides sounds more Christian? I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I didn't say it. I didn't mean it like that. I didn't mean it. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. That's okay. I'm Jewish. <laughs> hey, <me too. laughs> well, there I go. You know, but I mean, I mean, you know, the right was to claim all of this Christian religious faith i am we are the ordained ones and we have uh, we have the ultimate conversation with yahweh and god but our actions say that we have more of that faith loving uh uh intentions in us by saying no 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 not it's not just about me it's about the entire state and we we you know we all do better when we all do better yep and that's that's absolutely right and in judaism there's a a belief called uh tikhan olam yes. which is a world repairer which is basically if something is wrong, if there's a social injustice, you try to fix it. Um, if there's something broken, you try to repair it. And um, you know that's one of uh, my core beliefs as well. And one of the reasons that I've been so you know involved in social justice as well as uh, more recently politics, just just trying to to fix some things that I see that are broken. Absolutely. And, you know, it's not easy for candidates to give up their time with their families. Um, you guys could be doing a whole heck of a lot more things than instead of, you know, trying to solicit votes and solicit help. But but it's that servant heart that I, I hope to see more in our state house versus the politician. Right. I mean, yes, we are. We are all. Have you have you guys received any fundraising dollars? Either one of you? A few. Okay. Then you are now a professional po politician. So <laughs> I just want, I mean, everybody, anybody can be a professional politician. It's just a matter of, you know, raising the money, but we need servants. We need public servants who understand, you know, how we bring our communities together and uplift everybody. All right. Y'all ready to hit the big one? Let's talk about how the state of Indiana is working really, really hard to defund public education. Go. <laughs> as a, go ahead as a teacher. Right. Well, 
you know, it, it all started with the school choice and giving voucher money to charter schools and to private schools. And for the life of me, I don't understand why our taxpayer dollars are going to private religious schools. I think if parents want their, their students to get a religious education, then they ought to pay for that religious education. There should be a separation between church and state, and there's no way that our tax dollars should be going to that. Absolutely not. And I think there has to be a lot more accountability with school choice. Um, they don't have private schools, for sure, don't have the same accountability as public schools, and neither do charter schools. And if charter schools can't prove that they can do something different than a public school, well, then there's no reason for them really to be in operation in the first place. And they're, they're funding, um, you know, disproportionately across the board. They're giving charter schools and uh, private schools a bigger piece of the pie. Meanwhile, the public schools are suffering and public schools like the one that I serve in, in the urban city, are, are really suffering and the funds are being cut. So our friend Eduardo put out a, uh, Jorge, he put out, I, yeah. like, his, I like I like saying Eduardo, but uh, <laughs> uh, our friend Jorge put out a, a post today. Hi, Jorge, you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> he put out a post today that highlighted um, uh, arrest discrepancies um, in public schools, the entire state, because he's a nerd like that. And I, you know, yes, we, need to I elect, that. we need to elect more nerds too, by the way. Um, and, and you, and you, I'm sure certain that you see a lot of other types of inequities that are happening in our public schools that could definitely be addressed without taking and siphoning money out of those schools. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, one of the things that we can do too, is we can get rid of the test, the standardized test that we use. We teachers can know right away whether our students are understanding our lesson or not. The formal term for that is a check for understanding. I can tell you what a noun is right now, and I can ask you, give me an example of a noun. And if you can't do that, I need to reteach it. And if you can, I can move on. You know, we can do portfolios. There, there are tests. That, that's, it's just ridiculous the amount of money that we spend on standardized testing these kids. And it's not doing them a damn bit of good. Honey, follow the money. doing them a bit of good. Follow the money. You know why we do the testing. Somebody's getting paid. Aaron, mm -hmm. you said you have a daughter. You know, what's, yeah. that, what's that education? Um, yeah, she's going into uh, kindergarten next year. And um, Did she get to have know, any pre-K? That was what I was uh, just going to mention right then. She only had about three to four weeks of mm. pre-K before COVID hit. Okay. And um, that's one of the things that I really feel that we could do in Indiana is we why don't we have some kind of universal pre-K? Florida has it. If Florida can do it, we can do it here. And not only when it comes to pre-K, but just giving teachers some of their negotiating power back to not only um, determine what lesson plans they want to do, but also things like um, negotiate for longer prep periods so kids have longer recesses. Here in Elkhart, uh, students used to have some of the longest recesses in the state but um, ever since the collective bargaining agreements have changed and things like that, it's, it's one of the, the shortest now. And without, you know, with more prep time, better lessons and things like that go right hand in hand. Also, um, to a shift from needs-based um, education the way it is right now, the funding for it. Um, the way it was explained to me by some educators, correct me if I'm wrong here, is that um, schools that have fewer kids who are on um, free lunches and things like that actually receive more funds than school districts with kids that are on um, free and reduced lunches. So, you know, my, like I said, my opponent has done great for Penn Harris schools, but he has done very poorly for Elkhart community schools. Yeah. And I think this, I honestly think that this pandemic ha and uh, everyone's desire to open the schools back up, get the kids back in school is actually showing how successful they have been at weakening um, teachers' ability to, to collective bargain. Because the, one, of the, one of the main pillars of union and, and, um, and collective bargaining was workplace safety. That was like a, when, when, when buildings were catching on fire and they were locking the doors, workplace safety, OSHA, all of that was was being bargained for and now you can see okay 
everybody's talking about the kids going back to school, but nobody is talking about who is at risk. And it just it just speaks to the fact that I mean, I read I've been reading articles all week about how teachers are updating their wills and getting extended life insurance. That is sickening. That is just absolutely sickening that we are telling people they have to risk their lives like that. We And we don't even want to pay them. We don't even want to give them a raise. I, I, oh, don't I, get me started. I, no, I want to get you started. Come on, girl. Well, listen, listen to this. Okay, so I have a bachelor's degree in elementary education with a minor in Spanish. I'm bilingual. Muchos saludos a todos los hispanohablantes. Show off, but go ahead. I have a master's degree in secondary education with an emphasis in English as a second language. And I started a second master's degree in educational leadership, two classes, and then I'll have finished that. So I have all this education. I had to take an elementary education test. I had to take a Spanish test. I had to take a secondary education test. And I had to take an ESL, what we call in Indiana, an ELL test, $114 a pop. If you don't pass it on the first try, because it's almost impossible, um, you've got to pay for it yourself to take it again just to be licensed. Now, in order to keep my job, I have to take the language arts test. Uh, nobody in the state of Indiana is giving the test, so I have to drive all the way over to Lima, Ohio to take the test and pay another $114 just to keep my job. Why do you think teachers don't want to stay? Not only do you not want to pay them what they're worth, but you keep making them take test after test and get certification after certification. I mean... You know, what more are you going to ask of me? Do you want my blood? Well, oh, they, it seems oh, like but, that's what you want. Yeah, they want your blood. They want your air. They want the linings in your lungs. They want your esophagus when they put the, the tube down there. They literally are asking teachers and all school employees, uh, administrators, counselors, cafeteria workers. Those The cafeteria workers are the ones that I'm like, or, the, you know, the janitors. Don't, they have, I mean, they don't have even what our teachers have. Right. They have even less and they are going to be put at risk. And 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 it just drives me crazy that, you know, nobody is st who on that side is standing up for them. Now, mind you, our superintendent of education, you know, she she she's 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 a teacher. You know, she is not partisan. She, you know, I, I, even though she says she's a Republican, I don't think they knew what they were getting when they they hired Miss McCormick. But no, nobody is actually talking about how do we protect our educators, our mind molders, when we don't want to pay them, we don't want to give them health care, but we're asking them literally to go walk in a minefield every day and not give them any protective armor. Exactly. And I don't think that they really thought out this plan. Look, I love what I do. I love working with students all day. I cry because I want to go back to school and see my kids. But at the same time, I know that COVID cases are going up. My husband, he works in the hospital. He just said to me before he left work today, you know, Julie, I just want you to know that we're getting a lot of COVID cases back in the hospital again, and we've got to be really careful. I don't want to bring this home. He already had it. My son already had it. It's already been in our house. You can get reinfected with it again. And um, now they want to send, you know, kids back to school, teachers, cafeteria workers, bus drivers. And you know darn well that it's going to escalate again and we're just going to end up shutting down the school and having to do online learning again. Absolutely. So, you Absolutely. know, why are we doing this to people? Are we, how can we say that somebody's life is more important than somebody, somebody else's life? We have to ensure that we protect everybody's lives that we possibly can. I, I agree. And we know that schools are Petri dishes. I don't even know why they I mean, Aaron, are, do you feel safe sending your five, six-year-old into elementary school when you know whether masks are required or not? They're not going to keep them on. No, I, I really don't. And, and here's a, the thing, too. Um, back in 2014 and 15 during the Ebola outbreak, I, uh, I spent six months in Liberia as an Ebola nurse. And the reason that I went over there was because so many nurses rushed in to treat um, sick patients without proper protective equipment. And so many of them tragically perished, mm -hmm. um, which is why I always say that there is no emergency in a pandemic. Um, and I've said that to like nurses left and right as um, COVID has struck around the country. I spent uh, two weeks in the Navajo Nation back in May as a volunteer nurse in Shiprock helping out down there. And I said the same thing. 
there is no emergency in a pandemic. If you don't have the proper protective equipment, if you get sick, if you get ill, if they knock you out of the game, then who's going to come in and take your place? And the same thing goes for our, you know, our teachers. You know, there is no emergency in a pandemic. If we can't figure this out right now, why the rush? Why are we pushing so um, headstrong into this when we know the risks are there, when we know cases are rising, and when we know that, you know, young kids are not able to, you know, follow those instructions as well as we would like them to? You know, let's take a second. Let's breathe. And remember that there's no emergency. We can get through this. Well, and breathing is, is, is something that, you know, this virus is not going to allow you to do. It just, it just sucks. I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I don't understand what, I mean, I get it. I, you know, I believe that we must have a strong economy. I am not one to say, you know, America should just be broke. Nobody thinks that. Everybody wants us to be prosperous. But at what risk? I mean, we, this, when we were forced to shut down, we saw the cracks in the foundation and we actually know how to fill them. We see that if, every, if we get internet out to every home, like there's electricity and plumbing, that we can probably do some of the things that we actually go into buildings to do. We can do things differently. Um, we also saw that, first of all, my MBA, I got it online. I, st I went to a university online. I did that back in 2011 and 2012 when people were going, oh, online school, how hard can it be? <laughs> it, I cried my first two classes. <laughs> I cried. Uh, you can ask my best friend, Crystal Allen. She'll tell you. I called her in about a managerial accounting class. I cried. I cried over my uh, uh, quantitative analysis class. I cried. So it's not that the work, the work is still there. It's what, it's what you put in is what you get out. So we know that the technology is there. We're not trying to make it readily available. We're putting lives at risk for what? So that the person can go work at Home Depot? I, I'm, I'm just, y'all have to help me here. I, I don't understand. It's, it's incredibly frustrating um, seeing um, in part the science denialism that has been spread uh, by the Republican party from the top um, down. The uh, attacks on Dr. Fauci, you know, and every and the CDC that have seemingly kind of been around since the beginning is incredibly frustrating to see. And, uh, you know, I feel really horrible for for teachers because they're in the same position as nurses were in early on in this, yeah. where we were yeah. praised as heroes, yet we weren't being provided as pro with proper protective equipment when we were expected um, to throw you know, our lives into the fire, like, like teachers are being asked now, while other people are refusing to wear masks or wash their hands and things like that. Uh, it's, we can, we have a, a lot of work to do, but we can, we can do it. But wouldn't you guys also say that that messaging comes from the top down? And absolutely. absolutely. And forget about 45's orange behind, he's orange. So, I mean, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not racist or anything, but he's orange. I'm not sure what race that is, but it's not even just him. It is our governor. Our governor has been on the wrong side of this thing for a long time. And I'm, I'm going to do something I normally don't do. I'm not too thrilled with what Mayor Hawk said, my Democrat mayor, but he didn't demand we wear masks until July 9th. Ah. Uh, you knew we were in stage 4.5. You probably could have made that request a little sooner, bruh. This is the largest county in the state with the most people. I, I, somebody somewhere who is in an executive position needs to step up and take this thing by the reins and, 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 and lead from the top down instead of this, you know, we're just going to discredit Dr. Fauci. I mean, who is discrediting Dr. Fauci? A bunch of trust fund babies? This dude, has been, he, this dude has been to school and has been, you know what they tried to attack him on? You brought it up and I wasn't going to talk about it, but they tried to attack him on the fact that he has been in his role in that capacity for 40 years. I'm sorry. Is that a bad thing? This is a man who understands science inside and out. And you want to make it a bad thing that he's been in that capacity for 40 years. That's all you got. So yeah, they need to get up off of Dr. Fauci. Um, and they need to do better as far as leaders um, are concerned. Um, so, all right, 
I, and I we can... got a good doctor uh, running for governor here in Indiana, too. So Yes, we do. Dr. Woody Myers. And I got some news for y'all. I got some news for y'all about him and some of the things he's working on. I know Stacey Myers has been out there posting all her stuff up, but I'm going to do that at the end of the show. So you guys have been kind of campaigning. Uh, Aaron, is this your first time running for office? Uh, third, actually. Third? <laughs> I Okay. Then I don't know why I call y'all new. Y'all ain't new. Y'all been around. Um. Talk about the things that you're seeing in your community that that are um, are that you want to specifically speak to when it comes to Elkhart. Uh, when it comes to Elkhart, you know we are one of the largest manufacturing hubs in the state, but when the economy gets hit, it gets hit hard here in Elkhart. Our unemployment numbers in May were 28 percent unemployed, uh, which is above Great Depression levels. Mm -hmm. uh, right now we're at 11 to 12 percent. You know, a lot of folks for a long time have talked about how do we diversify the economy here? You know, that's a big concern for folks is when things like this happen, how do we make sure that people are still have their jobs? Right. That's, a, that's a major concern for folks as on top of, you know, education concerns here in, um, in town. Uh, people are worried about COVID. They're worried about sending their kids to school. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of worry here and it's, it's concerning, but our current leadership uh, hasn't really responded to it. You know, it's just kind of fallen on deaf ears. You know, at the local, you know, state representative level and state senate level, there's not a whole lot of um, talk about COVID numbers. There's not a lot of things like that. It's all just about jobs and the economy, it seems like. And jobs and the economy are great, but I want to make sure our kids are safe. I want to make sure that our teachers are safe. And, you know, we can do that. You know, um, it's interesting you bring up jobs and economy because one of the things that is happening um, in our state, and I, I know you're probably filling it up there in Elkhart too, is that um, the wages are not increasing. So who is the economy actually working for? If, if, if you all you care about is the jobs and the economy, what kind of jobs and how much are they paying? And how is a good economy helping these people that aren't getting wage increases? Exactly. Why is Indiana one of the few states that still has a $7.25 minimum wage? You know, we need to raise the minimum wage to $12 to $15, in my opinion. We have to remain competitive with all of the states around us. I'm, I'm almost inclined to believe with the, with the way that they, uh, the, the state house is making sure that we don't have quality, affordable health care, how we are defunding public education, how we, are, we crap on the environment, I really don't think they want us to to grow our economy and, and, and invite businesses to come to our state. I I can't tell. What in those well, actions what say? They lose. What in those actions say? Hey, Indiana's appealing. Come live here. I mean, there's there's nothing. I, I don't. I, it seems like they're being counterintuitive uh, to to what they say their goals are. Julie, what's going on in Fort Wayne that we need to know about? Oh my gosh, Fort Wayne was on fire. We are still. Please don't be on fire. Yes, we are still reeling from uh, Mr. Floyd's death. We um, we had protests and we had police brutality with gassing. I got gassed myself out there. Um, oh yeah, oh yeah. No warning, and the police fired uh, their tear gas at us. Um, you know, I'm an older woman. I cannot run, and I had to walk. You know, a couple miles from uh, the Martin Luther King. Uh, bridge where I was all the way to downtown Fort Wayne to a park to get away from the police and their attack. It was terrible. Um, I was, you know, fortunate because I was able to get away as they were blocking off exits and then make it back up to my vehicle where it was parked, but they corralled everybody into one area and then gassed them over and over and over again. So we actually are being sued, the city of Fort Wayne, by the ACLU for this. Um, it's been a big controversy here and, uh, and we're still reeling from it. And, and there are folks that don't want to talk about it. Um, folks that don't believe that police brutality really exists, that racial profiling really exists and they, they don't want to talk about it and they don't want to do anything about it. And the other side does. Well, and I, I got to uh, ask this question. I don't mean to interrupt because I want you yeah. to go back to the story, but you have a four term incumbent Democrat mayor and my guy, he's my guy. Tom Henry, Mayor Tom Henry, what has he said about this issue? Has he said anything? He was very slow to react. 
and sided with the police, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. I'm sad to say. Um, they did a PR unity march after they had gassed everybody. Um, and he created a council. He's still, I believe, putting people on that council um, to look at those problems that are happening within the police department. But it's not good enough. We, we have to do better. We, we have to legislate at the, at the um, state level you know, no chokeholds. Absolutely not. We don't need any chokeholds on anybody. Uh, we should elect our police chief. Absolutely. They should be on the ballot like because that. they need to represent our community. And, you know, Fort Wayne is a diverse community and our mm-hmm. police chief does not represent that. Mm-hmm. Um, police officers, I know that they do hard work and that they put their lines, you know, in the, in the line of fire every day. And I, I respect them for that. But there is no reason to kill an unarmed person. Um, You know, they need higher education and diversity training, just like everybody else. We need to look at community policing. Um, There are programs out there. There's a teacher next door and a police officer next door program out there that will allow police officers and teachers to buy homes. They will help them buy homes, pay for their closing costs, reduce the price of certain houses um, for them to live in the communities in which Mm -hmm. they serve. And I think if you're going to be a teacher or you're going to be a police officer, you should like and have an investment in your neighbors. And your community. If you don't want to serve those people, then you shouldn't be in that neighborhood or that community. You have no business there. Absolutely. I I have said it once, and I've got some police officer uh, homies that don't live in Marion County. The the, uh, public safety, and anybody who works in public safety, that is the only city county uh employment that you can get where you don't have to live in marion county and i just have an issue with somebody living in whiteland down in johnson county coming to police 42nd and post you don't have it's 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 literally two different worlds it's two different worlds two different mindsets two different mentalities so what may seem aggressive to you mr whiteland is just some homeboys kicking it on 42nd and post but because you all scared you all scared of the, the melanin. Melanin frightens the hell out of people. I don't know what that's all about. I don't know what that's all about. But there's, the melanin has scared you. And the first thing you want to do is grab your little pistol. Dog, if you live next door to, to, to Kiki and Jojo, then you might actually understand how they living and why they living. And, and they just in the struggle like you in the struggle. And they not, they're not a threat. I mean, it just, I mean, it, I, I can talk all day on that. My face oh, was terrible. My- in, in my district, um, County Council District 4, Larry Brown had to resign because of all the pressure that constituents put on him because he said during a county council meeting that, um, unfortunately, they vote and they breathe. And it was, it was being broadcast to the public. They vote yes. and they breathe. Only the they straight ones. And they breathe. <laughs> Only the straight ones, us gay ones, we do. We <laughs> ours is a little bit more choice. We don't just breed; we reappropriate. Uh, we actually have to go into a lab and make it happen. Go on with that. <laughs> some of us, some of us, some of us do it but naturally. The thing is, there was so much outrage by the community that he did resign. Well, that's good. And we need to put more put pressure. The Republicans appointed somebody else and put put them in that seat. Well, you know, and I believe that we ought to hold every elected official. And I actually am more convinced now than before that our Democrat elected officials need to take anti-black racism training, not just diversity training, not just equity training, not just anti-racism training. There is a, you know, there is a a conscious anti-blackness because... I was reading, uh, there's an IU professor who just dropped a book and I was reading an interview that she uh, was talking about the the model minority and how we see Asians as, as and people of Asian descent, be they Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, or even Indian, um, as the model minority because they, they make more money per capita than any other demographic. And so they're saying, hey, listen, here's a minority group that can make it in America. What's wrong with these black people? But it's the circumstances are different. The circumstances are we're not discounting what what they went through as Asians in America, but their their experiences are very different. And ours is there's a lot of anti blackness in almost everything. And and until we until we can get even our Democrat leaders, and I'm I'm 
I'm I'm feeling this one because I, I I heard about a situation where some Democrats didn't want to take it, <laughs> and I was like, I beg your pardon. <laughs> you know, I'm just not understanding because the bottom line is, this is a community that you said you wanted to serve. You said you wanted to serve this community. Then you need to learn as much as you possibly can about that community so that you can serve them better. It ain't about you. It's about what you need to do for other people. So, man, I didn't know they were hoarding people. They were rounding people up and blocking off exits. That's just, they were like trying to hurt people. They were. That's that's really what it appeared to be. And, you know, a lot of my students were down there, you know, as a high school teacher. Um, you know, I, I wanted to go and make sure that they were okay, that they were being safe. Because, you know, our youth was standing up, yeah. you know, not yeah. just for themselves, but we had a lot of youth down there as allies. Yeah. And, um, you know, that was that was something that was so positive to see in our community and why they didn't see it that way. I don't know. Oh, because, you know, anything that's a threat to the power structure is viewed, viewed as um, the enemy or some kind of, um, you know, attack. And, and again, I, I am I, ha I am a fan of anybody that is willing to serve our public properly. But I don't believe that our police department should be the judge, jury and executioner. They should, all, their job is to arrest. That's all it is. That's right. Their job is to arrest. Your job is not to decide whether or not whatever crime you think that they have been doing or not doing or did five years ago is you getting to decide whether or not they should live or die. That's where I have an issue. That's, that's where I have an issue. So, you know, that... You know, we didn't even really touch on justice reform. I know Aaron mentioned it because he worked in the facility. We didn't even talk about the fact that our prisons are are overrunning with COVID. Again, we talk about how there's intersectionality in all these different topics that we're talking about. Um, we talk, you know, we talk about um, age, uh, not age, but wage uh, uh, stagnation. What the? How much money you get determines what kind of education your kids gonna get, kind of health care you gonna get, whether or not you're living in a, a environmentally deprived um, area. All of these things are all intertwined, yet we have people on the other side talking about, it's me, 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 me. I did all this by myself. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Aaron, tell the people where they can find you. Well, you can find me up here in Elkhart. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Michler for Indiana. You can find uh, our website at MichlerForIndiana.com or our uh, Facebook page, which is Facebook.com uh, slash Michler for Indiana. Um, I'm always open to any questions or if anyone just wants to talk about any of the issues that we uh, spoke about today or anything else. Uh, my campaign motto is a better tomorrow. Oh, I love And that. I know that things can sometimes seem dark right now with COVID, with police brutality, with so many of us out of work or underemployed. Um, but I know when we work together towards a common goal of making things better, that we all can have a better tomorrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. Better tomorrow. I like that. And are you having any virtual town halls, any virtual phone? Are you doing any phone banking, anything like that? Uh, coming soon. Okay. Okay. So, but they can find all that on your Facebook and all your social media feeds, right? All right. And don't forget if you liked anything that he said, I did. I was loving the fact that he was basically a nurse over fighting Ebola. I was, t I was excited about the fact that he went to our Native American um, uh, places to help out over there. He is obviously community oriented. He has the community in mind. He has a young daughter. So he's looking for quality education for everybody. I'm telling you, I, he said a lot of things that I liked. I hope you did too. All right. Julie, tell the people where they can find you. They can find me on Facebook, Instagram. I have a website, Dominguez, for F-O-R, the number 16.com. I would love to hear from them. I need volunteers. Well, yeah, we need volunteers. All the volunteers we can get, that's for sure. You know, and I mean, because phone banking, we still can reach out. You're going to need to do that's some... Right. You're going to need to do some lit drop at some point, and yeah. um, you also got to buy that list. So click the donate buttons, y'all. Help their campaigns out. $10, $5, whatever you can, because we need to flip these seats that these guys are, are running in so that we can get some balance in that state house, so we can get some things taken care of. All right. what Julie, did you have a motto for your campaign? I mean, Aaron. I do. Clown. Realize the vision. Say it again. I was talking. Realize the vision. Realize the vision. 
That's what's That's right. up. Realize the vision for a better tomorrow. What? Right. I think we got it covered. That's I right. think we got <laughs> Y'all, thank y'all so much for joining me today on Turn Left. Y'all were awesome. Y'all got my energy up. I'm I'm kind of hyped right now. I believe Elkhart and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Fort Wayne, because Julie's talking about education. She has a she actually has a plan on how we can improve edu- the quality of education. She's out there in these streets, um, fighting for uh, racial justice, criminal justice, and all those other things. So she was saying some things that I like too. So, but most Democrats do. I know. I, I, I know. I just love Democrats because we are on the correct side of things. And we're fighting a good fight. We are fighting a good right. fight because we want to make sure every Hoosier has an opportunity to live their best life, not just a select few. Thank you so much for coming on the show. You guys are fantastic. I wish you the best of luck. Donate to their campaigns. Indiana's on Dana Black, turn left. You know we are here every Thursday from six to seven talking to candidates from all over our state. You know I'm booked up out of the way to October. That means I'm gonna be bringing you people who are running for the state house all from all over our state because it's so important to hear about the issues that are happening in their region. Who knew that they were rounding people up in Fort Wayne so they can gas them? That's just, that's bad, y'all. That's, that's bad. We gotta do better. Indiana's on Dana Black, turn left. Thank you so much for joining in. I will holler at y'all next week. Peace.